The Snowtown Murders, sometimes referred to as the Bodies in Barrels. A name was given to 12 murders in South Australia in the 90s. At a rented former bank building in Snowtown, the remains of eight victims were found in barrels. Police spied on people for a long time, resulting in the discovery of four monsters that have been arrested for the murders. John Bunting, Robert Wagner, Mark Hayden, and James Vlasakis. This group was heavily influenced by the ringleader, John Justin Bunting. He was driven to murder by his hatred of paedophiles and homosexuals, and has been called Australia's worst serial killer. As the central figure during all of the killings and tortures, Bunting is regarded as someone whose character motivated the other perpetrators. His favorite pastime as a child, was burning insects in acid, and during his teenage, he was a neo-Nazi. In adulthood, Bunting developed a deep hatred of homosexuals. We'll start first with a look at each monster. Robert Joe Wagner became friends with Bunting in 1991. Bunting encouraged him to assist in the criminal activity, and he did so. Mark Ray Hayden pleaded guilty to assisting the serial killers dispose of the bodies. James Vlasakis, together with his mother and half-brother, lived with Bunting, and was gradually drawn into participating in the murders and tortures. Elizabeth Harvey, Vlasakis' mother, was aware of the murders, and with Bunting's encouragement, assisted in one of them. Thomas Trevelyan assisted in the murder of Barry Lane in 1997, which was committed by Bunting. Jody Elliott, sister of Elizabeth Hayden, Mark Hayden's wife, was a woman of below average intelligence, who had developed a crush on Bunting. Using the alias of a deceased former acquaintance of Bunting's, Suzanne Allen, she attempted to collect her social security benefits. The gang later murdered Elliot's son, Frederick Brooks. Now let's get into this disturbing story. John Bunting lived in Murray Bridge, South Australia, for eight years. He was married to Elizabeth Harvey, the mother of Vlasakis. So, as a father figure, Bunting spends a lot of time with him. He told Vlasakis time and time again, how much he hated pedophiles and homosexuals. And that when Vlasakis told Bunting that when he was 13, his stepbrother, Troy Oder, molested him. So, Bunting took the information and kept it on his wall. In fact, Bunting created a rock spider wall chart in his bedroom. The chart comprised mixed pieces of paper, some of which were connected. Bunting wrote the names of people he considered dirty because they were homosexuals and pedophiles, on those pieces of paper. These types of people were also referred to as rock spiders. But he mostly picked the victims for imagined infractions on a whim. Some victims were murdered as Bunting suspected them of being a pedophile, usually based on a rumor. Others were relatives, sometimes living in the same house, as killers. They were picked as easy targets, to satisfy Bunting's desire to commit a murder. And that was the case with Trezies. One day, the man disappeared with no trace. No one could ever find him or think about his disappearance until 1997, when a television program called Australia's Most Wanted presented Trezies' story. Again, in 1998 the same program showed footage of a skeleton at lower light. Still, the program made no connection between the skeleton and Trezies. But, Vlasakis watched the latter program with Bunting and his mother, who was then married to Bunting. Vlasakis recalls Bunting said, that's my handiwork. Following this, Bunting said, he and Hayden murdered happy pants. At that time, Vlasakis did not know the deceased's real name as Bunting referred to him as, happy pants. As to why Happy Pants was killed, Bunting said the guy was a pedophile. Bunting told him he had lost it, and smacked Trezies on the head, with a hammer. Trezies's body was found buried in a shallow grave in 1994. He was last seen alive in 1992. After Bunting and Hayden had killed Happy Pants, they drove down the road, grabbed Robert Wagner and Barry Lane, and forced them out there and buried the body. 
There was another body on top of Trezise's body, but sadly they could not recognize who the person was. As you watch the rest of the crimes, you may want to let your imagination run wild. Because this horrible gang, used to torture their victims, with knives, bloody sores, and avariac, to administer electric shocks to the genitals, and other sensitive parts of the body. And that was the painful torture and death, of Ray Davis. After being placed in a bath, he was garroted, with ropes, and tire levers, beaten about his genitals, and had a toe crushed, with pliers. Poor Davis was an intellectually disabled man, who lived in a caravan behind the house of Suzanne Allen. In about 1993, Davis and Allen had a relationship, and lived together. At the time of his disappearance, Davis was living in a caravan, parked at the rear of Allen's home. Davis was murdered, by Bunting and Wagner in December 1995, and was never reported missing. Bunting and Wagner were later seen cleaning Davis' caravan. They moved it to Elizabeth House, painted and sold it, two months after Davis' murder. They also continued to claim Davis' welfare payments. On May 1999, police found Davis' body, buried in a hole. They also found the body of Suzanne Allen in the same spot three days earlier. When Davis and Allen disappeared, the property was occupied by Bunting. Annette Cannon, Allen's daughter, spent Christmas Day 1995, with Suzanne, and Davis. The following day, her son said that Davis had sexually assaulted him, and his brother. So, they reported that to the police, but, on their return, Davis had already, left. His caravan and belongings, were still at the place. But Cannon, never seen Davis again. Thereafter, Cannon saw Bunting, Wagner, and Suzanne, cleaning out the caravan. They later found a receipt in a used tour, and the signature was Bunting. The registration papers for the caravan were located in a Ford Marquis, registered to Laura Martin, that name was used by Harvey. In 1999, Bunting was filmed accessing Davis' account. Most withdrawals occurred at Murray Bridge locations. It appears that approximately 32,000 Australian dollars, was falsely obtained by accessing Davis's benefits. Multiple documents connected to Davis, were found in Bunting House at Bundera Court. And as for Davis's love, Suzanne was last seen alive in late 1996. Her body was found in 1999, above Davis' body. A post-mortem examination was unable to determine the cause of her death. But, they found parts of Alan's body, in eleven plastic bags. Bunting assumed control of Suzanne's car. The car was then re-registered and insured in the name of Harvey. Jody Elliott, she had a relationship with Bunting. Elliott lived with Hayden and Elizabeth. She slept in the shed at the rear of the place. So Bunting arranged for Harvey and Elliott to impersonate Suzanne to maintain her pension. Bunting was filmed accessing the benefits on two occasions. After the death of Suzanne, five different addresses were provided to Centrelink, as part of the representation that she was still alive. Two of those addresses, where Bunting lived with Harvey. As part of providing residences in the name of Suzanne, on September 1998, Hayden drove Elliot and Elizabeth Hayden to Owen. Bunting had found a property and told Elliot to rent the property, she signed the rental document in the name of Suzanne. A large amount of documentation connected to Suzanne was found in different rooms and in the ceiling of Bundara Court. After the disappearance of Alan, Bunting and Wagner were both involved in telling false stories about Suzanne whereabouts, to a close friend of her, Carol Parker. Details were provided mainly by Bunting, often in the presence of Wagner. On April 1997, due to that missing person report, police spoke to Bunting. He said that Suzanne had stayed with him, but had moved to Mildura. She also did not give any contact of her, because she did not want her brother to know her whereabouts. Several months after Davis and Suzanne were murdered, Bunting kept it up. Gardner was the next victim, he was openly homosexual. He was last seen alive in September 1997. His body was found in a barrel in the bank vault at Snowtown. 
but one of Gardner's feet had been removed so Barry Lane's body could fill in, and close the lid. A rope was around Gardner's neck with a slip knot behind his right ear, and his left foot had been removed. Gardner lived with Nicole Zurita, a cousin of Veronica Mills, who lived with Wagner. On September 1997, a friend discovered that the place had been ransacked, and Gardner was not there. So, Zurita reported the matter to the police. Wagner did not like Gardner because he was homosexual. One time, Gardner placed his hand over a child's mouth to stop him from talking. Wagner was horrified, and after the incident, Wagner would not allow Gardner near their child. Zurita received a call from a male, saying that Gardner wanted his wallet. She told the caller to ask Gardner to come get it himself, and she hung up. So Vlasakis visited her, and said he intended to commit a breaking offense and leave Gardner's wallet behind. Anyway, she gave him the wallet, and later, Vlasakis gave it to Bunting. After the disappearance of Gardner, his memo was found at Bandara Court. The book contained a loose page, on which Suzanne's personal details were written. As for the other body in the same barrel, Lane was last seen alive in 1997. He had a gag in his mouth and tape covering it. A rope was around his neck, and his body was dismembered. Lane and Wagner, who dated in 1996, met Bunting when he moved into the property on Waterloo, Corner Road. Lane was openly homosexual, but Bunting regularly hung out with him. Notwithstanding his hatred of Lane, Bunting used Lane, to extract information about pedophile. Vlasakis also told Bunting, Lane was a pedophile. And therefore, his name was written in the center of the chart, and linked to other characters, including Davis. In 1997, Lane's ex-fiancé, reported him missing. When there was questioned about Lane's disappearance, he said they were not likely to see Lane again, as Lane had sold a car to some bikies and had done a runner. He said they might find Lane, face down dead, when the bikies found him. After the murder of Lane, Bunting took possession of Lane's motor vehicle. He said he had purchased it for a television receiver, and $50 cash. At the time of his disappearance, Lane received Centrelink benefits. The card necessary to gain access to Lane's account, was found by Mills, after the arrest of Wagner. Investigators sought to link Wagner, with Lane's death, because they possessed stuff belonging to Lane or associated with him. Some documents connected with Lane, were also found in the ceiling of those houses. A car ramp belonging to Lane, was located in the used store unit, rented by Bunting. In the Ford Marquis at Mofflin Road, police found some documents related to Lane, together with Lane's pensioner concession card. Only one month after Lane's murder, Bunting's next target was Thomas Trevelyan. The guy had psychiatric problems and wore only army-style clothing. He shared a house with Barry Lane, for five months. Trevelyan had also helped Bunting and Wagner, in the earlier murder of his housemate, Barry Lane. Bunting murdered Trevelyan because he had a big mouth, after finding out he told others of his involvement in Lane's murder. Trevelyan's body was found hanging from a tree, on November 1997. A damaged and empty milk carton crate was nearby. No means of transport was present. The pathologist found no evidence to suggest that a second person was involved in the death. At that time, the authorities did treat the death as a suicide. On the 6th of November 1997, Wagner told detectives that he last saw Trevelyan on the 4th of November. But, he did not mention him and Bunting, taking Trevelyan for a drive. But Vlasakis stated that Bunting and Wagner, hung Trevelyan from the tree. Trevelyan was forced to stand on something, then kicked out from under him. Bunting said it was easy to make the death look like a suicide, by leaving money in his pocket. Bunting lay low for a few months, then returned in April 1998. It was Gavin Porter this time, he was found in a barrel in the vault, and the cause of death couldn't be determined, because of his state. Porter and Vlasakis were good friends, when he was killed, 
Porter lived with Vlasakis, Bunting, and Harvey. Porter's murder shocked Vlasakis, because no one had expressed any desire to kill him. Bunting and Wagner expressed concern about Porter's drug use after his murder, and called him waste. When Porter was murdered, Vlasakis had heard about previous murders. Still, he had never seen a body, or a barrel having a body. Vlasakis went to the Murray Bridge Drive in the night of the murder. When he got back, he was told, Bunting and Wagner had killed Porter while Vlasakis was at the drive-in. Porter's car was there, Wagner and Bunting were inside. When Bunting showed Vlasakis Porter's body, Vlasakis was astounded. He saw a significant purple mark on his neck. Porter's body was in the shed, when Gardner and Lane's bodies were in the barrel. Within a couple days of the murder, Bunting showed up on the scene with a barrel. He uncovered Porter's body, and put it in the barrel with Vlasakis's help. Now, the barrel containing Porter was next to the first barrel. The rope was wrapped around Porter's neck, and he talked to him about moving his head because it was caught up. There were a lot of false stories, about Porter's whereabouts after he was killed. They were designed to create impression that he was alive. But after Porter's death, Bunting gave Porter's key card to Vlasakis. He had it a few weeks, then he gave it back to Bunting. Bunting wrote Porter's bin number, and family details in a book found in the ceiling, at Bundara Court. Hayden also occupied the Blackham Crescent building. In the shed, they found two Centrelink post-mortem's death letters with Hayden's prints on them. Only four months after Porter's brutal murder, Bunting wanted to take revenge for Vlasakis, who got molested as kid by his own brother. During the search of the bank vault, dismembered parts of Ude's body were found in two barrels, and the body had been badly defleshed. Vlasakis admits to being an eyewitness to the murder of Yoda. He had told Bunting that Yoda had raped him when he was a kid on many occasions. Bunting was pissed off at Yoda's behavior, but there were no plans to kill him, or talk of killing him. Vlasakis himself didn't think Bunting would kill Yoda because he was Vlasakis's brother. And also Bunting was in a long-term relationship with their mother. In the lounge room at Burdekin Avenue, Vlasakis was asleep. He was woken up, and given a bat, and a pair of handcuffs. Bunting, Wagner, and Hayden, all had jack handles. The four went to the down bedroom, where Yoda was asleep. They walked into the room, and Bunting said, now. The four men swing into Troy. Yoda jumped into the bed with his back to the wall. That's when Bunting and Wagner flew in. Vlasakis put the handcuffs on Yoda. After putting one handcuff on, he walked into the living room. Then Vlasakis found out Bunting and Wagner, were soaking Yoda in the tub. Back then, Vlasakis still thought Yoda should be beaten. Vlasakis left the bathroom after Bunting abused Yoda, physically, and verbally. He couldn't handle it, and he thought Hayden couldn't take it either. Vlasakis witnessed Wagner torture Yoda, but did not report these experiences. A tape recorder was made, and Yoda was forced to make abusive statements, at his mother and others. Bunting encouraged Vlasakis to take advantage of the situation and get Yoda to apologize. Vlasakis knelt in front of Yoda, and talked to him. Then Yoda apologized. Bunting told Vlasakis to get a bag from the lounge room that had duct tape and gloves. Yoda's mouth was taped after a sock was placed in it. And again, more violence followed. Initially, Vlasakis thought Yoda would receive only beating, but then realized, Yoda would be murdered. Bunting said they had to see this, when Vlasakis, and Hayden, weren't in the bathroom. So they went to the bathroom. A rope was tied around Yoda's neck, and a jack handle, was put into the rope to twist it. Vlasakis knew, Yoda would die, and he wanted it to be fast. He helped twist the rope, but it broke. Wagner tied it up again, and finished the job. Bunting asked Hayden, to get surgical gloves, and garbage bags. They went to the bathroom, and the body was handcuffed on the floor. Wagner put his foot on Yoda's chest, to check if he was dead. Then they all moved the body into the shed. 
Vlasakis was feeling shocked but did not show his feelings. Although he and Bunting, had cleaned up in the bedroom, Bunting had put Yoda's CDs in the fish tank, and messed up the lounge room, to make it look like a fight. When Harvey returned home, Bunting told her there was a fight, between Vlasakis, and Yoda. The argument continued, then Yoda left the house. Vlasakis and Bunting, drove to Adelaide to buy a barrel within a day. They put it in the shed, and Yoda's body was in the barrel, but his legs were sticking out. So, Bunting had to do a slice and dice. Using a knife, Bunting cut around the joint of Yoda's ankle, and separated its foot. He put the foot in the barrel. After the barrel lid was applied, it was moved to where two other barrels were. Now there are only three barrels, one had the bodies of Lane and Gardner, and the second one had Porter's body, while that barrel with Yoda's body was shorter than the others. Vlasakis went on to tell false stories about Yoda's disappearance to many people. The stories were meant to make people think Yoda was still alive. Bunting gave him a card so he could access Yoda's bank account. It was necessary to lodge forms with Centrelink to keep the Centrelink benefits Yoda had received. On a paper dated, October 1998, Bunting's signature, and Wagner's fingerprint were found. Yoda had a book containing practice signatures in his and Porter's names at Bundera Court. Yoda's financial records were found in a green garbage bag, that looked like it had trash in it. It was in the ceiling at Bundera Court. Some of the documents had Hayden, and Bunting's fingerprints. Bunting got himself busy this month, after Yoda's murder, he wanted another easy hit. Which he could find in Frederick Brooks, who was last seen alive on the 17th of September 1998. He lived with Hayden, Elizabeth Hayden, and Jody Elliott, Elizabeth Hayden's sister. Brooks' last seen alive was the day Bunting, Elizabeth Hayden, and Elliot traveled to Owen to look for a property Elliot would rent in the name of Suzanne. At that time, Bunting was in a relationship with Elliot. Bunting referred to Brooks as a pedophile, on a few occasions. Yet, there was no talk of killing Brooks. Bunting asked Vlasakis for assistance. They walked to Burdekin Avenue, and as they were about to enter, Bunting told him he had Brooks. Once they entered, Brooks was handcuffed, Wagner grabbed Brooks around the neck. Followed that, a lot of physical violence, and torture, by Bunting and Wagner. Using an electrical impulse machine called a Variac. He got a pin number for his phone, and phrases abusing Elliot, Hayden, and Elizabeth Hayden. Bunting wrapped Brooks's body in trash bags, and put it in the boot of a white Tirana. And Hayden left, and came back that night, the trailer was attached to Hayden's land cruiser. He then loaded the white Tirana, onto the trailer and towed it away. Vlasakis then helped Bunting place an answering message, on Brooks' mobile phone. When Elliot called Brooks, she received a foul message telling her to leave Brooks alone, and should not call him again. Vlasakis assisted in misleading Elliot. Shortly after Brooks disappeared, Vlasakis asked for Brooks's clothes, and his toiletries. Vlasakis and all accused were involved, in fraudulently obtaining the continuation of the Centrelink payments, to which Brooks was entitled. This was done for the benefit of Hayden. By this time, the barrels containing the bodies of Gardner, Lane, Porter, and Yoda, had been moved from Burdekin Avenue, to Blackham Crescent. Gary was seen by Bunting, as an easy target and murdered, so Bunting could gain from Odwire's welfare payments. On October 28, 1998, Odwire was last seen alive. In the vault, Odwire's body was found in a barrel, and electric burns were visible on his chest. Bunting, got Vlasakis to help him get information, about Gary Odwire's finances, and if he had any family. Bunting also called Gary, a fag, and dirty, and said he must go to the clinic. In fact, it was Bunting's way of saying, Gary, had to die. At Bunting's insistence, Vlasakis arranged for a few friends, to drink with Gary. They got a carton of beer, and made Gary drunk. About 15 later, Wagner grabbed a wire by the throat, and he immediately collapsed. 
So Bunting told Wagner to ease off, and then a series of physical abuse and torture followed. The Variac was used to extract information from him. During the time he was being tortured, Valasakis left the apartment to the party. The following day he came home, to see his mother, and Bunting, who live at the same address. He told them, in the presence of Harvey, that Gary had run into trouble, with some aboriginals. And he had purchased everything he had owned. Bunting said the same story to his neighbors. When Vlasakis later visited the place of Odwyer, he noticed a strong smell, which was worse than the smell, emanating from the barrels. So he walked over to Bunting, and asked if Odwyer's body was there. In response, Bunting said the body was in a barrel. He suggested the smell was from something in the freezer. But it was actually, from a dwyer body, which was stored in the shed at Hayden's. Bunting then arranged to issue a keycard, so Odwire's bank account could be accessed, to receive Centrelink payments. Documents relating to Odwire, were found in the ceiling at Bandara Court. Odwire's freezer, was found in Elizabeth Harvey's place. The only female victim, Bunting and Wagner's second to last murder. Elizabeth Hayden was the wife of Mark Hayden, and shared a house with him, and her sister, Jodie Elliott, who had a brief relationship with Bunting in 1998. On the 22nd of November 1998, Elizabeth Hayden was last seen alive. She was found dead, in a barrel, in the bank. The tape was wrapped around her mouth, and head. Bunting regularly spoke of the need, for Elizabeth Hayden, to go to the clinic. There is no suggestion that these types of statements, were made in the presence of Hayden. On the evening of the 21st of November 1998, Elizabeth Hayden asked Elliot, to get Hayden away from the house, so Hayden could open his birthday gift. So, Elliot asked Hayden if he would take her to McDonald's, at Rainella. Hayden agreed, and Elliot drove to Rainella, where they waited at McDonald's. When they got back, Bunting told Hayden, that Elizabeth had made sexual advances at him. Elliot offered to talk to Elizabeth, but Bunting told her, to leave her alone. Bunting then said he was going to Hungry Jack's, to get something to eat, and asked Elliot to accompany him. Elliot left, leaving Hayden and Wagner, in the house. She hadn't seen Elizabeth and thought she was sulking in the bedroom. When Elliot and Bunting got back from Hungry Jack's, Hayden told them, Elizabeth went off with her boyfriend, and he didn't say who he was. That behavior didn't seem ordinary to Elliot, because she sometimes kept boyfriends secret, and disappeared with them. A tape of Elizabeth's voice was found by police in the ceiling, at Bundara Court. Vlasakis was first told of the murder of Elizabeth, when Bunting came with a barrel in the back of his Ford Marquis. The barrel was put in a Sigma parked at Vlasaki's house. Bunting said, he and Wagner killed Elizabeth, but the conversation was mainly about the police onto him. He said barrels were in Hayden's car, and on the trailer. As for a motive, Vlasakis heard Hayden tell Bunting, he had told Elizabeth about Trezise's murder. Hayden knowingly made false statements about Elizabeth's behavior and movements. The first time, was to Elliot, after Bunting returned from Hungry Jack's. Hayden knew, Bunting and Wagner had slain a bunch of people. He knew there were barrels having bodies in his shed. Maybe he knew his wife would be murdered, when he left the house. However, Hayden wasn't a party to the murder of his wife, so Bunting, and Wagner, took an extraordinary risk by killing her, while Elliot and Hayden were away. Anyhow, Hayden, supported his friend, over his wife, continued to lie, and carried on with his life, preparing for the next murder. Unlike the others, Johnson was no fag, even had a girlfriend. But, Bunting disliked Johnson, since the day they met. He often said, Johnson needed to die. Johnson was killed on May, 1999. Almost all his hand skin had been removed. And the right knee, had been disarticulated. Vlasakis lived with Bunting at Bandara Court. After talking to Johnson about the computer, he went home, and Bunting was in the ceiling. Hayden and Wagner were holding ladders on the floor. Bunting came down with a pair of handcuffs. 
Bunting asked Vlasakis, how it goes with Putt's head. He was referring to Johnson. And that was first time, Bunting told Vlasakis, he wanted to kill Johnson. Dot this is the type of conversation, didn't happen around people other than Vlasakis, Bunting, Wagner, and Hayden. Bunting put a plan for Vlasakis, to lead Johnson to the disused bank, in Snowtown. Johnson and Vlasakis drove separate cars to Harvey's house. Vlasakis called Bunting at 7 p.m. to say, the side door was open. Bunting said the machine was ready. As soon as he and Johnson entered the bank, Wagner grabbed Johnson around the throat, and Bunting put handcuffs on him. After a few questions, Bunting told Johnson he just wanted to talk to him, and he'd be gone in a half hour. After a while, Johnson's socks were removed, and his mouth was taped up. Following that, he was beaten up, and tortured. He was forced to read a script, Bunting had earlier prepared, and provide his bank pin. Wagner and Vlasakis attempted to access Johnson's bank account, leaving Bunting and Hayden with him in the disused bank. Unfortunately, Wagner and Vlasakis were unsuccessful in withdrawing funds from Johnson's account. And when they returned to Snowtown, Johnson was dead. Not only dead, they found Bunting and Wagner had dismembered Johnson's body, then fried, and ate some of his flesh. Johnson's girlfriend, Linda Kovarskis. On the 9th of May 1999, she spoke to him, when he told her Bunting was getting a computer. As of the 12th of May 1999, Kovarskis inquired about Johnson's whereabouts. When no good answer. Kovarskis, and her mother, visited Johnson's home about on the 13th of May 1999. They knocked, and were welcomed. Bunting told Kovarskis, Johnson had made a 13-year-old girl pregnant, and saw someone else. Kovarskis noted Johnson's clothes, and possessions, were still in his room. So, Kovarskis told him to tell Johnson to call. If she didn't hear from Johnson, she'd call the police. In response, a plan was implemented to satisfy Kovarskis. Vlasakis registered a SIM card, using Johnson's birth certificate. He then gave it to Kovarskis. Bunting arranged for Elliot, to pose as Johnson's girlfriend. When Kovarskis called, Elliot pretended to call out to Johnson. She told Kovarskis, Johnson must have been on the toilet, and that she had to go. Elliot hung up. The SIM card, was later found in Bunting's phone, on Bundara Court. It took five years of criminal investigation, to find the barrels, in Snowtown. In connection with the unrelated crimes, police discovered human remains at lower light. Police installed a listening device, in Mark Hayden's house, after Elizabeth Hayden disappeared, and recordings from it were used in court. Clinton Trezise's remains were found at lower light, after he was murdered in Bunting's living room, at Salisbury North, South Australia. Ray Davis and Suzanne Allen were found buried in the backyard. The bodies in barrels, were stored in several places, before being moved to Snowtown's bank vault. Among them, was Bunting's shed at Murray Bridge, in April 1998. The three barrels were later moved to Hayden's property, at Smithfield Plains. On the Adelaide Plains, near the Clare Valley, five barrels were stored, in Hayden's Toyota Land Cruiser, while a sixth barrel was kept in a Mitsubishi Sigma, at Murray Bridge. Hayden rented a bank vault, under the name Mark Lawrence, the name he used before he married, to store these barrels, which he later moved back, to the hometown of Snowtown. Attempts to identify the remains, found mummified, rather than dissolved, which was the apparent intention of storing the bodies in acid barrels. Killers chose hydrochloric acid, which mummified the remains. After a series of pre-trial hearings, the first of the accused to be sentenced was Vlasakis. He was given four life sentences, on June 2001, after having pleaded guilty to four murders. In the summer of 2001, Bunting, Hayden and Wagner reach pleaded not guilty to ten counts of murder. All of Hayden's first crimes were dropped due to insufficient evidence. On September 2003, Bunting, and Wagner, 
were found guilty. Bunting was convicted of 11 murders, while Wagner, who had previously pleaded guilty to three murders, was convicted of seven. Both defendants appealed their convictions. On each count, each man was sentenced to life imprisonment, to be served cumulatively. The presiding judge said the men were in the business of killing for pleasure, and were incapable of true rehabilitation. Hayden was charged with two counts of murder, and six counts of assisting offenders. Hayden testified he was not a party to the crime. After four days of deliberation, the jury convicted Hayden of five counts of assisting in the crimes. As part of a plea agreement, Hayden pleaded guilty to assisting in the killings of his wife, Elizabeth Hayden, and Troy Oda. As part of the settlement, prosecutors will also drop an additional charge, of assisting offenders. Thank you so much for watching. Be careful out there. And sorry for keeping you waiting for so long.